Thanks, Pastor Andrew, for the applause prompt. And thank you, Church of the Crossing, for being out this day. This is the first Sunday of Advent in the ancient liturgical calendar of the church. Four weeks counting down to Christmas. I am so thankful, as is my wife, who's in the room with me, to celebrate this Lord's Day with you. My name is Jim, and I am so thankful not only because it's the first Sunday in Advent, but because I have a chance before I open the Word to tell the Church of the Crossing how treasured you are in a large family of churches called the Church of God, of which you have been a part from your beginning. And it's my privilege as a general director for the General Assembly of the Church of God in the United States and Canada to be able to travel the world because we not only work here, but we are in 90 other countries abroad, and to travel the world and to see the church in its expanse and breadth. And I promise you, you would be astonished, you would be impressed, and you would be humbled how many times the name of this congregation is spoken around the world because over many, many decades, you have left your fingerprints of grace and love and truth and witness with them. In fact, so excited to hear about your year-end offering to help benefit families here in Indianapolis, right at your front door, but also abroad in Bangladesh, because within the last year, I've been in Bangladesh. And everywhere I went, in villages, in ministry centers, I found plaques that say, Church of the Crossing, Indianapolis, Indiana. Because over many, many years, you have been faithful in sharing and working together. We are a team in the Church of God, and from a new church plant in Temecula in Southern California to a new church plant in Dubai underway right now, in all of this expanse, you're part of the team, and we thank you for your faithful witness and your partnership with brothers and sisters in the Church of God here in the United States and Canada and around the world. Today, well, yes, give yourselves a hand. A phenomenal, phenomenal testimony. That all said, I Need a Miracle. That's the series that you have been experiencing for the last few weeks. Today is the close. And I'm so excited to be able to speak into this series because a miracle. I mean, come on. Don't we all need a miracle? Many people would say, oh, I don't believe in that stuff. But I would forecast that in every person's life journey at some point or another, whether they believe in God or not, they're, they're thinking, I need a miracle because we all find ourselves in corners sometimes. Sometimes our backs are against a wall, and we know we alone are not enough. And we need something from the outside to reach in and intervene in the course of our journey to provide life and hope and future. Have you ever thought about what it means to have a miracle? On the screen, you'll see a definition from the Cambridge English Dictionary just from this year. A miracle, that's a noun, is an unusual and mysterious event that is thought to have been caused by God because it does not follow the usual laws of nature. In other words, in the popular parlance and actually in the root of the term, a miracle is something that is attributed to God or a supernatural being or a deity or something beyond the natural order of this world because its impact, its effect, its occurrence cannot just be explained naturally. A few years ago, I had the chance to take a cruise with my family. I had signed up, I'd been invited and agreed to uh, be a teacher on a cruise. You know, one of those Christian cruise things where you get a boat and all the casinos are dead and empty because all the people on board are Christians. Oh, maybe you've experienced that. Unless you wake up at 2 a.m. and realize some of the saints are doing the tables too. But in any case, I was on this cruise that was going to leave from Venice. I had my wife and children in tow. I have four sons. It's been a while. They're all adult men now, but they were kids then, and we were flying from the States to get to Venice to get on the boat for seven days in the Adriatic and the Greek islands. It was going to be dreamy. By the way, my teaching series then was Joan and the Whale, which proved not to be such a win for the people on the boat. But in any case, as, as we were on our way, there were thunderstorms on the East Coast and our connections from Indianapolis to the seaboard, across the ocean to Paris, and then to... Venice, we're all just topsy-turvy. I was running, jumping over barriers, scaling glass walls to get my kids all on the plane on time from here to here to here. We landed in Venice. We had left plenty of time in our schedule to come to Venice a day early, but we got there within 20 minutes of closing the gate on the boat as the ship was going to sail. We ran into the ship, realizing as we boarded that we did not have any luggage, none. It could not keep up with us. 
And as we set sail and watched Venice fade in the distance, I lined my wife and children up along the cabin wall and said, hear me and hear me clearly. If you ever, ever see any of that luggage again in your lifetime, it will be a miracle. <laughs> because there is no way, there is no way those suitcases are going to show up. We have sailed from Venice having had three connections late. How in the world would we ever see it again? And my children looked at me, big eyes. My one son that had that Michael Jordan jersey for which he was willing to lay down his life now, lost in a suitcase. <laughs> they began to believe in God and pray. <laughs> and you know that two days out at sea, a boat came from Dubrovnik in Croatia with our suitcases? And I stared at them all and I said, there, don't ever tell me you don't believe there is a God because there's no way this could have happened. But as I tell you that story, I realize it's kind of cavalier because, well, I understand how airlines work. I understand how cruise ships work. I, my first job out of law school was at Northwest Airlines, now Delta. And, and I, I lived in the industry and I'll tell you what, there's tremendous capacity to work miracles. Never take for granted when you get on a plane and land somewhere and there's a suitcase that shows up, eventually even. Is it really a miracle? Well, there are several things in life that we cannot control that other persons might do that could be a miraculous occurrence. And of course, another person might be used in the hand of God to actually supernaturally intervene in the course of our life. But today, I want to talk about miracles that require the obvious and absolute intervention of God. Others may play a hand, and he may organize others' hands to do good, but you know when it happens for you that it was God showing up. The world needs a miracle. Israel needs a miracle. The Gaza needs a miracle. The West Bank needs a miracle. Ukraine needs a miracle. Russia needs a miracle. The American presidential election needs a miracle. And maybe some younger voices. Oh, sorry, don't get me going. I'm just saying there are a lot of things we could talk about. Our city in Indianapolis needs a miracle. Seattle is my home and people in Seattle are always going on about crime and so on. Well, Seattle is three times the size of this city and I promise you the evening news in Indianapolis has somebody shot every night. It's almost predictable. It's almost passe. What's it going to take to help turn the page and make the place that we call home safe in the most elementary way? Miracles are required, but today's message is not about that kind of miraculous intervention, though hold this as a footnote. It is not foolish to pray for miracles on the world stage. It's not foolish to pray for miracles in the Middle East. It's not foolish to pray for miracles in the city of Indianapolis. God is greater than all of the sun. But today, it's been my privilege to be asked to speak about people who need a miracle personally when they have lost a dream when there's been something longed for and it seems to be beyond the grasp, what do we do? Is it possible? Is it possible that even that thing that is beyond our grasp, that the ship has sailed and there's no way we can catch up, is it possible that God still works miracles for people like us? Absolutely. On this first Sunday in Advent, Look at the first chapter of Luke with me, beginning with verse 5. This is the New Living Translation. It's a famous story about the annunciation of the birth of a child, not Jesus, but his forerunner, John the Baptist. When Herod was the king of Judea, there was a Jewish priest named Zechariah. He was a member of the priestly order of Abijah, and his wife Elizabeth was also from the priestly line of Aaron. Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in God's eyes careful to obey all of the Lord's commandments and regulations. They had no children because Elizabeth was unable to conceive, and they were both very old. One day, Zechariah was serving God in the temple, for his order was on duty that week, and as was the custom of the priests, he was chosen by lot to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and to burn incense. When the incense was being burned, a great crowd stood outside praying. While Zechariah was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the incense altar. 
Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him. But the angel said, don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Your wife Elizabeth will give you a son, and you are to name him John. You will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He must never touch wine or other alcoholic drinks. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth. And he will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. He will be a man with the spirit and power of Elijah. He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of fathers to their children. And he will cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. Zechariah said to the angel, how can I be sure this will happen? I'm an old man now, and my wife is also well along in years. Verse 19, then the angel said, I am Gabriel. I stand in the very presence of God. It was he who sent me to bring you this good news. Now take a moment and bow your head and heart with me and pray upon the reading of the word. Father, we are so thankful for the scripture. We're thankful that it has been preserved across time and space, oceans, continents, centuries, languages, cultures, for us to hear even now. We're thankful for your Holy Spirit that first penned these lines by Luke's hand, and we're thankful for the events that it records, supernaturally, miraculously, intervening in human history. I pray, Lord, that all of us, all of us in the room now, will move closer to your will and way and approach even the miraculous for having been here now. And I pray the single and the sacred name of Christ Jesus the Lord and for his glory alone. Amen. Zechariah and Elizabeth, two people who longed for miracles. They hoped to conceive a child, and in the ancient world, even as sometimes in today's modern world, the failure to have a child, one longing to have one, can be one of the greatest challenges of a lifetime. I know something about this because I'm an adopted person. I was adopted, and adopted by two people who were unable to conceive. My mother had waited over 10 years for a child, desperately wanting to have a child, believing God had created her to have a family, but it just was not coming together. And there's a whole miracle story about how I fell into her arms. I know something about this burden because I've been a pastor for 40 years before I took my present post, and this sense of what the Scripture here describes as barrenness whether it be some kind of physical challenge in a woman's body or in a man's body, whatever it is, whatever the, the reality of it is, it's, it's that unspoken longing, but it today represents all unspoken longings. How many people in this world long for a life partner to be married to someone they can trust and love forever as long as this life shall last? How many people in this world long for some kind of stable job where they wouldn't have to worry from day to day or week for week? And it seems impossible. It's, it would take a miracle to get a job like that given their sense of their own preparation and skill set and so on. How many people long for just good health? How many people long for some freedom from something that now enslaves them and there's no way on earth that they have so far been able to find to be set free? I mean, there are so many levels of human experience that can be encapsulated in this illustration, in this true story of Zechariah and Elizabeth. But we have to know that as God is going to work a miracle for them, there are some pieces of the story that are important for us to also take on. First up, Zechariah and Elizabeth were considered righteous by God. This is not to say that God does not work miracles for the unrighteous. It is to say that your chance of receiving a miracle for the thing that is your heart cry is greatly enhanced if you are yourself devoted to God. Zechariah and Elizabeth were not perfect, no one is. They could not figure everything out, nobody can. They did not do everything right, nobody does. But there was something about the quality of their heart, and none of us can tell our own hearts except God and yourself. 
but there was something in their longing, their generosity of spirit, the way in which they have framed their life that knows that there is a God, their maker, that they will serve him, they will honor him. It says they did everything they knew how to do to obey his commands, to live within his framework. This was their ambition. They had many, many stumbles in life. Everyone does. They had one big void of ache in their heart. No children in their life was flying by, and now they're aged past a time when any person might reasonably be expected to conceive a child. All of it evaporating like the morning mist, but still... God saw them as righteous because they would not abandon God. They would not curse God. They would not blame God. They would not wallow in their pity. Something about their quality of heart allowed God to see them as righteous friends. Today, whatever you carry, whatever you're longing, whatever miracle for which you hope, be certain that your heart is soft and open to the one who made you. And furthermore, they fulfilled their duty. Zechariah was a priest. He was born of a priestly tribe. Every male descended from Levi in the Old Testament was considered to be a qualified priest. But over time, over generations, there were many more male descendants of Levi than than could be accommodated at a single temple. And so during the reign of King David, they were divided into 24 divisions. And even then, there were more than could actually get the nod. But he, Zechariah, was a part of a particular division of Abijah. And, and as he was, his, his number came up. His division was going to have a chance in the long course of the year, 52 weeks a year, they're working in the temple of God. They're managing the worship of God in this sacred space. And and Zechariah, in this, the second temple period, Zechariah's team gets the nod to step up and actually manage the temple. And then, even more remarkably, Zechariah is chosen by Lot to go inside to the holy place of the temple, a place to which very few people would ever access. We cannot know for certain, but it's likely that someone in Zechariah's station would only have one chance in a whole lifetime to go through the great sacred gates into that most holy part of the temple, just outside the veil that separated the holy room into two, from the holiest place to the uh, anteroom where the incense was burned, and it was his responsibility to do it. He might have said, I'm not doing it. I'm angry at God. I'm not going to church this Sunday because you know what? He just doesn't show up for me. I've had a heart cry for years. My wife and I have been praying for so long. I'm not doing this job anymore. It just doesn't satisfy me. How can I know that it's even true? Because things have not worked out like I designed them to be. You see, there's a lot of that going on in our world. It even happens in our churches. But he was faithful. He was true. He was responsible. And he went in and he did his job. He bloomed where he was planted. He took what he had and did what he could. And as he was being faithful in the extraordinary and yet at the same time ordinary course of a Levite's life, an angel appeared. The altar of incense was just on one side of the veil the veil famously rent in two at the crucifixion of Christ. And there was an altar there where incense was born, was burned all through the day. There were two moments during the day, one at 9 a.m. and one at 3 p.m., where a priest would go in and tend to this burning incense. We're not sure if he was in the morning set or the evening set, but because there was a crowd outside praying, most scholars have interpreted that it was probably the 3 o'clock assignment. He's there in the afternoon. And as he is, he's doing his job. He's he's just doing what he should. Oh, but let's not mistake, he was doing it in the house of God. And there appeared an angel that startled him. He was shaken by it. The appearance of this angel is the first evidence that a miracle is in store. The appearance of an angel at any time helps us understand that there's just a very thin membrane between our material and physical universe and the spiritual one. We don't think about this, and this often blocks our access to miracles, in that we are so preoccupied with the material and physical that we are not conscious 
that we are walking in the midst of also a spiritual reality. I am mystical enough to believe that there are angels about us right now in this room. Every night before I sleep, I ask God to post angels on the four corners of my house to protect my house while I'm asleep and cannot be alert. Angels are the evidence of God's mystery working among us. The scripture is replete with illustrations. If you read your Bible storybook, you'll see them from start to finish. If you deep into theology, you'll understand that angels are the messengers of God. In the Old Testament through which I've been reading this year, God refers to himself most often as the Lord God of heaven's armies. What's that? Heaven's armies are those legions of angels that are in the unseen realm, but they're always nearby. The thin, thin wall. Maybe you've seen that wall break down between your material and chronological moment into eternity. Maybe at the passing of someone held dear. My mother passed away three years ago. I was with her. I didn't expect her to die as I was in her company, but she did, and I experienced in a palpable way the union of the physical and the material as my mother moved from one dimension to the next right before my eyes. I'm here to tell you there are angels at work right now around you in your car at Keystone at the crossing in the mall on the highway, in your front yard, in your garage, in your house. You may not think it, you're not conscious of it, but I'm telling you, if your heart is open and you will surrender to Christ as Lord, as you give yourself to God, he will send your, his angels and he will govern you. I pray every night that God will post his angels, not just around my house, but around my four sons, their wives, my grandchildren, my wife and I that those angels will protect us and guard us from the enemy's mischief physically, spiritually, emotionally, and mentally. Don't take this for granted. Set yourself up for a miracle. And never forget that you are in proximity to a spiritual divine that can change the course of your material being. The appearance of the angel not only tells us that we're very close, for the angel just appears. We're very close, but also that God has a plan. The reason that the angel has appeared is because he is going to declare to Zechariah a plan, a purpose in the mind of God that transcends Zechariah and Elizabeth's own hopes for a child. You see, our longing for miracles have a greater chance if we are surrendered into the will of God because the miracles will always take place to further the plan of God, not our convenience. Many of the miracles for which I have fallen on my knees to pray have really been in the end about my pleasure, my convenience. Oh, but I have seen some miracles in my life and the ones most astounding and that will go with me to my grave are those when I've seen them appear in my life, in my circumstances, consequent to a larger plan of God. Miracles happen, and they happen to further God's advancing reach to restore and reclaim a lost world, to bring life and fullness and hope and eternity to a people that he's created in his own image, that he loves more than his own life itself. Ah, but the miracle in your own life will come to pass as you surrender into the will of God. You may not even know what the will of God is. You could not have imagined what will be. But your longing probably is a prompt of the Holy Spirit if you are righteous before him in some way mysteriously connected to a greater cause. And you can expect to see a miracle then because the cause of God will not be detoured and you want to be a part of it. Also notice this in the story that the angel has come just now to tell Zechariah about this miracle that's going to take place in the conceiving of this child because of the timing of God. The birth of John the Baptist is the forerunner of the coming of the Christ, a long, longed-for Messiah. And first, the prophet as of old, the prophecies were clear. There would be one like Elijah that came forth. It's going to be your boy, Zechariah. 
The fulfillment of your dreams is far beyond anything you could imagine. It is greater still than anything you and Elizabeth could have hoped for. And yes, you've waited a long time. And yes, a lot of things have happened. And all of your friends have had multiple children and you've been to a hundred baby showers. You just leave weeping. But your child is going to be worth waiting for because yours is the Elijah, the forerunner of the Messiah, the anointed one. He's going to be so extraordinary that many people were rejoiced at his birth. Jesus himself said that no person was ever born greater than John the Baptist. In all of the history of the human race, no one, save Jesus himself, has been greater than John the Baptist. Not the Apostle Paul, not Martin Luther, not Mother Teresa, not a hundred or a thousand or a million other names you could bring up. John the Baptist, your son, Zechariah, your son is going to be conceived beyond human reason, outside the course of nature. It will be humanly conceived, this baby, but in a way that human nature has already passed you by. Your wife is aged. You speak the truth, Zechariah, and you're an old man, but you will have a new life. And proof of this will be the Holy Spirit will possess the child even in the womb. Footnote, if you'd like to speak to me about when life begins, please do, after the service. Because I was conceived out of wedlock. I'm an Irish citizen by birth. I'm a person whose life story could be the stuff of film. I'm hoping that Ryan Gosling will play me in the movie, but I'm here to tell you that my birth mother, a deep woman of faith who found herself in a desperate strait, who hardly even spoke English, for she's an Irish speaker from a poor village in the west coast of Ireland, she was taken to a doctor. I was born in 1952. Think of it, in 1952, she was taken to a doctor who said, for 25 US dollars, I will abort the baby. And you can go forward with your life and no one will ever know. Because in her world in those days, to conceive a child out of wedlock would bring shame not just on herself and economic dispossession, but also shame on her whole family in the small village where she lived. I mean, there are a hundred reasons why it made sense for her to abort me. But she said to me in my face when I saw her for the first time at the age of 58, she said, I was terrified and didn't know what I would do, but I knew what I would not do. I could not end your life because I knew your life was in me. The Holy Spirit was in John the Baptist before he was conceived. That's more than a glob of fetal cells. And that precious life, Zechariah, your child is going to be supernaturally touched and anointed to bring the Messiah and introduce him to the world. The angel said, your prayers have been heard. When you're longing for a miracle, sometimes we feel like, oh, we can't, I can't pray. There's nothing to pray about anymore. I, I've just prayed and prayed and prayed. Never give up praying. Every prayer offered by a heart sincere and humble before God is heard. My father that adopted me, whose name I bear, Don Lyon, he was as good a man as could ever have lived. He lived righteously, but he did not even believe there was a God. Nobody could know it. He outshined all the people who were professing believers. He came to church and loved it, but he didn't believe there was a God. And I didn't discover this because he was so good and everyone assumed because he was at church and so did I, that he was a godly man. But then as I became a young man, I realized in talking to him, he doesn't believe there even is a God. And then I became a pastor and then I became his pastor. And then I didn't know what to do and I started to pray. And I made a vow that I would kneel at an altar of prayer at the front of the church, wherever I was praying, wherever I was preaching, whatever I was doing, I would never preach a message which I would not get on my knees at the close and pray for my father's redemption, his salvation, his acknowledgement of God and the grace of Jesus. I never told anyone about which I was praying. I did want to compromise it, but I promise you, year after year, decade after decade, it came and went and came and went, and I thought it'll take a miracle for my dad. It's just not going to happen. And then one day while I was preaching at my church in Anderson up the road, my mother came down to the front with my dad afterwards. I thought my mom was praying. She was a woman of deep faith. And I just let them be. And then someone came and said, your mother would like you to come and pray with them. And I thought, all right. And I came and I went to my mom and I said, mom, what is it? 
how can I help you? Just making all these assumptions, this has to be about mom. And dad was just helping her down because they were aged. My father was 87 years old. And my mom said, it's not about me, it's about your dad. I said, what? And I looked at dad, and my dad's face is streaming with tears, and he's saying, I don't know, Jim, I don't even know what I'm doing. I don't even know if this is crazy, but in my heart, I have to surrender to God. I know he must be. Never stop praying. The angel says, your prayer is heard, and it's answered. But oh, poor Zechariah, Zechariah says, I... I get you. I hear what you're saying. The words are registering, but I don't see how it can happen. You see, Zechariah had enough faith to pray, but he did not have enough faith to believe his prayer could be answered. Oh, isn't that where we live? I can keep on praying, but I'm not sure it makes any difference. But God's purposes are greater even than our weakness if our hearts are for him. And when he said, how will I know these things to come true? The angel stands up tall. It's almost incorporated into the text with an exclamation point. Who do you think you're talking to? I am Gabriel. Gabriel first appears in Scripture and in history in Daniel chapter 9. Gabriel is the one who's going to announce to Mary that she's going to conceive the Christ child. He is the messenger of the Messiah. Gabriel is not just some lackey angel. He's not at the back of the crowd. He's a front bencher. He's an A-team. He said, I am Gabriel, and I come from the presence of God. Friends, do you have something for which you're longing for a miracle? Conform your heart and surrender it to God. Allow him to see you righteously by the work of his Son. Accept the grace and the peace and the beauty of the Lord's presence in your life by the work of Christ on the cross. And then pray. Let the Lord hear your heart cry. What is it that you need? Whatever it is, it may seem so far-fetched that it is beyond human capacity. Exactly. That's why you need a miracle. Then, be faithful where you are. Never turn your back on the discipline of serving God. And know this, the more you do this and the more your heart walks with God, the more you'll come into the presence of God. And when you come into the presence of God, just like Gabriel stands in the presence of God, yes, you can. Miracles happen. And God will move. Today, this morning, before you leave this room, take a deep breath and exhale out all the doubt, all the reasons why nothing can happen on your miracle case. Just exhale it and then bow in the chair where you are and just ask God to have his way in your life and to fulfill his great will by working a miracle in your journey. And maybe there's a prompt of the Holy Spirit in your heart right now to step forward and pray. And there are benches at the front, kneeling benches where you can pray. And I want to suggest to you that if there's anything in you right now, if there's anything in you that says, go kneel before me, come kneel before me with your prayer. Obey that prompt. Obey the command, just like Zechariah. And you come and kneel before God. And if you come to this side over here, right here, on my left, your right, this is a place for private and personal prayer. No one's going to bother you. It's just about you. You may be prompted to pray for yourself and a miracle in your life or for your child or your spouse or your parent or your coworker or your neighbor, whatever it is. You come there and no one's going to talk to you. It's just you and God, but you are going to obey the prompt to kneel before him. If you come to this side, a prayer partner will meet you and will share your heart cry because sometimes that's also part of what we need. But in either case, if that prompt is in your heart, do not sit still. Because here's a truth that you can stand on and take to the bank. The devil is never going to prompt you to kneel before God. And if there's anything in you like that, oh, just give it over to him. Would you stand with me as we pray? Our Father, this morning, we thank you for the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth. We thank you for the coming of John the Baptist. And most of all, for the coming of Christ. 
and for the way in which he ushers us into your presence so that we can see and know and be moved by the miraculous. We pray, Lord, that there will be testimonies born more than have already come to pass on this church family over the last weeks of this series. May there be even more in the week to come on this Christmas. By your direct and supernatural intervention right now, I pray that you will hold us close and work your will miraculously in each of us. For Jesus' sake, amen.